obviously a lot of uh, very interesting questions that our speakers may have for each other, but also we have a couple of microphones, I think, available for uh, the audience. So um, let's take, are you, do you feel like we'll yeah, take sure, questions? Sure. Okay, great. So questions back here, several questions, and great. Thank you. Hello. Dr. Hayes, um, question for you. Um, you mentioned the experiment in which the, the board came between the people and then a woman was on the other side. I wonder, did they continue with that and maybe have a child or some of, an, of another ethnicity to see if that would have affected the consciousness or unconscious? I'm not sure if they did it with children. Uh, they did do it with a number of different ethnic groups and there was uh, considerable convergence with the results. But it, it's interesting because maybe you could say that a child isn't quite so dedicated to maintaining a coherent worldview. I mean, that's one of the premises of children's books, right? That's not what I meant. I mean, when, when, when by having, a, having a child on the other side, so the person who is the, the oh, I see. you know, a right. child or someone of a different ethnicity suddenly there, if that might have changed the results. Yeah, they did do a similar experiment um, where the researcher goes up to a subject and he has a, um, a sheet with uh, four different women on it, all of a dif different ethnicity. And he asks the subject to pick out the woman that he thinks is the most beautiful out of this quartet. And so the subject chooses one of the women and uh, then the experimenter puts away that sheet and then pulls out another sheet in which one of the women he didn't choose has her picture and says, what is it that you thought there was about this woman that was so attractive? <laughs> and the, the subject will continue as if it was the same woman that he had picked out, even though it's a different woman. So uh, the dedication to coherence seems to be quite strong. Uh, so I had a question about the Chinese room, because I'm glad you brought that up, that um, on one level, why is it that a, a, lot of, a lot of behavior that I think happens according to this sort of Chinese room uh, mentality of someone sort of just going through the motions passes for thinking? Um, and I, I guess your talk is pushing against that idea by preserving thinking for certain things, but just... Why is it so often that people are in a Chinese room and yet are being taken as intelligent thinking people? I think it's an important question. <laughs> well, that's a rather different question than John Serrell hoped to ask <laughs> with his uh, thought experiment. And uh, I think that in a way Bernard's talk had more to do with that than my talk, so maybe you'd like to answer that. <laughs> why, why is it that knowledge formation is not... Uh, is not is frequently not the kind of thinking that people engage in. <coughs> <laughs> I believe that the question of, of the Chinese room is precisely, in my own uh, vocabulary, is precisely the, the arrangement between what I call tertiary retention, which is not only, uh, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, writing on a sheet, but which is uh, the environment, uh, which is constituting uh, the, what you call the system. And uh, generally, we believe that uh, thinking is only the, uh, the activity of the, the alive, the living uh, entity in the system, but in fact, it is the, the system as such. Uh, arranging all the dimensions of of the of the system, which are really producing what I call a circuit. It is the reason for which I believe that when we ask, for example, what is thought, what is uh, a knowledge, we must identify what is the circuit on which it is inscribed. And on this circuit, it is there. There are lots of what I call retentions and pretensions, which are produced even by the non-conscious cognizers. 
uh, which are the condition, in fact, of, of, of cognition of, and of consciousness. So I believe that this uh, generally for a long time in, in the Western uh, tradition particularly, we thought that knowledge is uh, an, an autonomy in front of heteronomous uh, uh, realities and we, we thought in an opposition the autonomy and heteronomy. In, in fact, uh, heteronomy is a condition of autonomy and of what I called in my own uh, uh, lecture uh, what I call disautomatization. If we need, if we, we produce disautomatization, it is because we are always in automated behaviors, and not only behaviors, but automated uh, milieu, and which e even, the, for example, uh, the sun is an automated milieu, you know, uh, the, 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 the program, uh, the, the, the uh, well, uh, the, the cosmic problem, co uh, cosmos is uh, a kind of automatic reality in which uh, living we are in negentropy and we, we feel automatic, automaticity as entropy and it is right automaticity is a, is a dimension of entropy and we produce something like negentropy, like negentropy. Uh, but the, the negentropy is not the opposite of entropy. It is a, a product, in fact, of, of entropy. I guess so. Uh, where my uh, my own framework <coughs> would differ from what Bernard was presenting to us is the idea that the cognitive non-conscious, which he is including in his schema through the idea of tertiary retention, the devices through which we extend our uh, cognitive circuits, our thought circuits, uh, now has the capacity to operate without human presence or human intervention as a, as a uh, system of feedback cycles leading to emergent behaviors. So one way to look at this is how has human cognition changed as a result of its interpolation into these circuits of tertiary retention. Another way to look at it is what happens when the cognitive non-conscious now can function independent of human intervention or control. So a good example of that for me would be something like automated trading algorithms, mm. which trade in the range of milliseconds. And the whole point is that they have no human intervention because that's what allows them to access this temporal regime inaccessible to humans. Yes, humans build the algorithms. Yes, humans can pull the plugs, but in between building them and pulling the plug is a whole ecological system of automated trading algorithms which can and have demonstrated emergent behaviors which couldn't be predicted on the basis of any single algorithm itself. So, that's the sort of power that I see now in the cognitive not conscious. Yes, I agree with that, but now we have a question to produce what I would call a critique of empirism, that is, a critique of, of um, the non-conscious cognizers. Because what you said, for example, with trading, automatic trading, it is a question for economics, for the science of economy. To, to, to theorize and to conceptualize where is decision when such uh, automatic uh, uh, systems are producing what we call today an economic crisis. And uh, this is the reason for which I refer to, to Kant. I'm not a Kantian philosopher because I believe, like everybody after Deleuze, Derrida, Foucault, that we can't reproduce the discourse of Kant. But I believe, nevertheless, that this distinction between reason and understanding, that is, analysis, which is what you call, for me, non-conscious cognizers. They are analytic processes, in fact. And synthesis, which is interpretation 
of this is necessarily what I call in my lecture a critical uh, <laughs> instance. And we need to produce today a critique of this level of uh, non-conscious cognizance because they are everywhere now in our life, in our cars, in our uh, economic life, in our social relations, etc. Et they are everywhere, in fact. And it is a problem of big data in general, not yeah. only in the, in the classical sense. So now we need to organize, for example, the political role, the, 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 the question of, of uh, public debate etc., around this deal between yeah. uh, the two levels. And I believe that we must reread Kant, not for repeating Kant, but for producing a critic of Kant, for revisit the question of criticism, of, of criticism today, mm -hmm. which is a technological criticism and not a pure reason, uh, a, a critique of pure reason. Well, I'll just uh, clarify that for me, one of the stakes in making the kind of argument I was was to leave behind forever the debates can machines think by shifting the definition yeah. of cognition. Yeah. And what's at stake for me in shifting the definition of cognition is to fully credit and understand the extent to which non-conscious agents now carry out fairly sophisticated cognitive activities. So as long as we spin our wheels in machines, can machines think, I don't think we're going to really be able to get at the centrality of what's happening today. But I absolutely agree with Bernard that a critical interrogation and a critical understanding of how the non-cognitive, -con non non-conscious cognition works is necessary for our contemporary cultural moment. Could you both uh, maybe address the uh, Bernard, La uh, sorry, Bruno Latour's theories of actor network? Um, because there does seem to be a hint of uh, both of you stressing the cooperative agencies of humans and objects. Obviously, there's a, uh, you both place more emphasis on the question of cognition and reason and thinking than Latour does, I think. But um, since he hasn't come up yet, I thought maybe if you could just say how you're pushing forward that argument or if you're actually against it. Well, I think that uh, Latour's argument of actor network theory was one of the first strong arguments for what's now being called a flat ontology, which is that you treat objects and humans simply as agents circulating through some kind of network, making connections, forming assemblages, uh, dismantling that assemblages, forming new assemblages, and so forth. And it had the great uh, advantage for Latour and other people interested in technology and providing a framework in which one could get beyond the uh, ultimate privilege given to the human and think of the human as merely another technological agent in this network. The disadvantage of that for me is that by moving toward a flat ontology, Latour simply sidesteps any questions of how consciousness works, mm -hmm. of how cognitive non-conscious might be distinguished from material processes, and consequently, he really has no resources to deal with uh, how these agents function conceptually. So I, I'm not opposed to a Luturian analysis. I think that it was made an important contribution. But I think now we're at the point where we sort of accept that objects and agents can all move in the same networks. I mean, how could we not with the, you know, the talks earlier this morning about the way networks function and everything. Now we can return to these vexed questions of what is thinking, what is consciousness, what is cognition, and enrich that picture with important distinctions. What do you think? I agree with, with Kate for, uh, on this question, and I, I would add that my problem with Latour is that he, he doesn't, in fact, propose arrangements between what I call psychical, collective, and technical individuation. 
processes of individuation. And he says, somebody told me that he said that Simon is, is, has no interest because uh, I don't know why he said that, in fact, but uh, I believe that this is a problem for me with Latour because he, he doesn't uh, study precisely these uh, complex uh, relationships between the, the psychical, the, collective, the social, and, and the technological or the technical. And uh, this needs uh, a genea what I call a genealogy of, of the role of tertiary retentions. Tertiary retentions are not only for me um, hypomnesic supports, but uh, they are things in general, in the sense of interobjectivity, in the sense of Latour. But this interobjectivity is used for destroying the question of intersubjectivity. And I think this is not interesting. Personally, I, I'm not interested in the question of intersubjectivity because I believe with Simono and Deleuze that the question is not intersubjectivity but transindividuation and, and, and collective individuation, this is, it, which is not at all intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity presupposes that the subject exists before uh, the relationship with the other subjects. Yeah. And on this side, I agree with Latour that uh, we, we, we can't think like that, but uh, there is not uh, an interobjectivity before subjectivity or intersubjectivity. It is a global process. And, and I believe that for thinking this, we need uh, Simondon, and, uh, and uh, Latour is not sufficient for this. Mm -hmm. There is, I'll, I just want to ask one question, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back, and we'll have many more questions from the audience. Um, the Latour's idea of reassembling the social and having a parliament of things, for example, have political uh, objectives. His idea is that this interobjectivity, if we if we accept his um, his assumption, his argument about this, that we will come to some kind of um, political inclusion for objects, for things beyond the human. And he often uses this as, uh, for example, a pro-environmentalist position, that if trees and stones could have a seat in the parliament, that then different decisions would be made than are currently being made. So there is a political utopianism, perhaps, about Latour that I just wonder if we can... I mean, Kate, do you think it's fair to contrast what you're putting forth as a dystopianism? Or do you think that, uh, in other words, Latour thinks that if we include the objects, we'll actually get to you know, a better world that is more fair, especially for the Earth and that kind of thing. But you almost uh, are proposing a different kind of future in which our objects become the singularity and, and uh, take over our mental processes. Do you, do you sense that opposition, or is that just science fiction? Well, I don't think I'm advocating a dystopian vision here. Uh, I would differ from Latour in that, to me, a, a plant is different than a stone, and an animal is different than a plant or a stone. And you could accuse me of being a... a cognitive hierarchist, and that's quite true. Uh, I, I do think that there is a sort of uh, hierarchy of, of cognition, uh, and that things which can cognize, whether they're humans or animals or uh, technical systems, uh, have more agency in the world than things that cannot cognize. Uh, and therefore, they have a kind of privilege not, according, not accorded to them by me, but they have a privilege in that they are actors in the world. Uh, all of this, of course, is itself built on material processes mm -hmm. and utterly dependent on material processes, but something magical happens when you go from the material process to an adaptive system. So in that sense, I, I wouldn't want to grant the same kind of rights to a rock that I would to an antelope, say. I don't know actually what kind of rights you would grant to a rock. I do know, actually. I used to live in Topanga, which is where all the hippies went to hang out after the 60s were over. And one day, a huge boulder fell down from the mountain onto the only road up into Topanga Canyon. 
And uh, so the highway department was called. They were they quickly estimated that the whole roadbed needed to be rebuilt, and the only way to get rid of this huge boulder was to dynamite it. And there immediately rose a protest group in Topanga, save the rock. <laughs> and people were wearing T-shirts, save the rock with the boulder on it. So, but I didn't buy one. <laughs> Did you want to say anything about that? Yes. <laughs> I believe that the concept of object is too general, too much general uh, or thing. You spoke of uh, the importance of categorization. Yes. And I can understand the question of a right of an object, but what kind of object? A traditional object, for example, has very important rights in the family, because uh, what is a transition? What is an object? Uh, we should reread Marcel Mauss, uh, 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 Winnicott, etc., for thinking this. Uh, there are lots of several types of objects, and it's not possible to produce a very general category of, of objects. So. Um, my problem here is that uh, the question is precisely the status of the object in the process of individuation. And the problem is not the rights of humans or the rights of animals or the rights of objects. It is the right as such, <laughs> which is not a right of, of uh, different instances. Uh, it is the right of the possibility of individuation, even for objects. But um, I believe this is too general. This way of uh, questioning is uh, too general for me. Okay. We'll, let's take a, another quick break, a five to ten minute break, and then we'll welcome up two other panelists and have much more discussion. Thank you. We have two respondents to Professor Stiegler and Professor Hales this afternoon who have kindly agreed to participate um, in this panel. Warren Sack is a professor of film and digital media at UC Santa Cruz. He's done a number of exciting interactive new media art projects that deal with, for example, digital access across national and linguistic borders and argumentation in the form of both conversation and heated verbal combat. Um, a great term. David Bates is professor of rhetoric here at UC Berkeley and is the former director of the Berkeley Center for New Media. Uh, David's forthcoming book, Human Insight and Artificial History of Natural Intelligence, examines early modern ideas of automata in relation to the post-industrial information era and contemporary definitions of the human. So Professor Bates and Professor Sack, if you could start us off. And uh, in a very short while, we will take your questions. <coughs> Thanks, Gail. Uh, so not only did I, did I agree to participate, I kind of set up this panel uh, when, we were, when we were designing the conference. And the idea was, was to really offer a couple of, of different voices, um, people working on projects very much connected with what uh, Kate Hales and Bernard Stigler are working on, and especially Warren Sack, who spent last year in Paris. And we were at a conference together last year that Bernard organized um, around digital studies. And I really wanted to have um, Warren say something about the project he's working on. And that might stimulate some questions that, that uh, really provoke our, our speakers, hopefully. So after uh, Warren maybe can say a few words, I might say a little bit more about the work I'm doing on the history of automatization and cognition. And, and we might pose some questions as well to our guests because they're the, the best interlocutors for the kind of work in progress that we're, um, that we're now involved in. I'll say Warren's work is progressing more than mine, perhaps, um, in terms of, of working towards a book. But I'd like to turn it over to Warren and have him explain his own thoughts on, on cognition, calculation, and, and uh, computers. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I want to um, just... Um, sort of repeat the enthusiasm that Gail voiced at the beginning. I'm, I am uh, fans of both Bernard and Kate, and it's a, it's a thrill to be up here to, to respond. I'm working on a book. Uh, it's for MIT Press for the Software Studies series, a series that James mentioned this morning. Um, it's about the liberal arts, and one way to think about the book is uh, to take something seriously that some of the most important computer scientists have said for the last 50 years 
that most people ignore. And that is, the, a lot of the um, people who've won the most important prize in computer science, that's the Turing Award, it's kind of the Nobel Prize for computer science, uh, Alan Perlis, um, Donald Knuth, um, Alan Kay, they say that computer science is a liberal art. So that is uh, enigmatic in a lot of faculties where computer science is often located in the School of Engineering or the School of Science. Um, what does it mean for it to be a liberal art? What would it mean? And I think a lot of, um, a lot of it comes down to um, thinking about a phrase that Donald Knuth, who's the uh, professor emeritus at Stanford of the art of computer programming, uh, what he said in the mid-80s, he said, you know, when we write programs, we should be writing as essayists. That is to say, we should be trying to try something out, essay something, um, and we should be writing in this grand tradition of the humanities. So it comes, the, the, the crucial thing, I think, comes down to what is language and what is writing. And so to just put my cards on the table right away, I'm going to tell you that I think digital writing is computer programming and that digital language is code and that this constitutes a huge shift in the episteme, if you want to call it that. Um, it constitutes a, a huge shift in how knowledge claims are made because we're, there's many areas now where in order to make a point to do a sort of apodictic demonstration like uh, Bernard was talking about in terms of ancient Greece. We don't do draw a diagram or make an argument. We build a computer program and we point to that. And that really is the argument. And so uh, an example of this is if we want to make an argument about global climate change, oftentimes that involves a simulation of the Earth and its climate. Right? So the, why is this a, a radical shift? The, the book hinges on explaining what's the difference between the languages that we, uh, we speak orally and that we write as prose and computer languages. And so just to give you one of those differences, I want you to consider the idea that in computer programming languages, there's two um, verb tenses. There's the imperative, do this now, and there's, there con there's the conditional. If this, then that. But there's no past tense, for example. There's no subjunctive. There's no all of these other uh, tenses that we have. So this is just this is one small slice, one small difference um, in uh, computer languages and, and uh, what let's let's use the computer science phrase in natural languages. Um, so why does that make a difference? Well, it makes a difference because then, politically, the people who have a say are the people who know how to code or who manage people who know how to code. And so the argument has educational uh, implications, such as the one that, um, I mean, th this is Bernard's notion of the padilla. What should be in the padilla? Um, and I, I think this long line of computer scientists will say computer programming should be there. But why should it be there? Because we see two arguments for this. One is a kind of um, conservative argument. Well, people need to know how to calculate on those machines. They're, those machines are everywhere. You know the machines I'm talking about, the computers. Um, so they should be able to wrangle with Microsoft Word and do something with Adobe Photoshop. Um, that's a conservative argument because it means that that is a kind of uh, facility that will, that's, that's nice to have, it's a little extra. The more radical one is to say, you know what, it's not just about having something extra, it's redoing everything from the inside out. So if you are in an argument where you have to make a computer program to make your point, like in a climate change um, if you're if you're if you're in an argument about climate change and you have to bring one of these simulations to the table, you're in a very disempowered position if you don't program or you don't have one of the programmers to do that. So, what there is is and and this is where I want to get back to um, 
two dichotomies that I think are, are quite analogous um, in what Kate said today and what Bernard said today. There's been a history in the building of, of, of calculating machines. We can see this right from Leibniz, um, but we see it also, let's say, in Vannevar Bush in his article, As We May Think, which is um, Kate more or less uh, quotes in her new book, How We Think, um, where calculation is something that is sort of below human. Let's use Kate's terms. It's a cognitive non-conscious. Um, or to use Bernard's terms, it is calculation. And so for, for, for Leibniz, the reason why he was building his first calculating machine, um, he's the philosopher, right, from a long time ago, uh, was because there were things that uh, men <coughs> with, a, with a, a mathematical intelligence shouldn't have to bother with. And that was going to be delegated to the machine. That was going to be over there. Um, again, this, this ex almost exactly the same words come up when Vannevar Bush invents hypertext in this, in this Atlantic uh, monthly article uh, where he coins hypertext, more or less. Um, and I see both Kate and Bernard also um, reinforcing this dichotomy between calculation and interpretation, what the machine <coughs> does, what we do. And I think what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in both of them responding to is a question of writing. And I've already told you what I mean by writing is coding. Um, because when we start writing computer programs about other computer programs, or we start writing computer programs that allow others to write computer programs, um, we're in a mode of coding that I believe uh, Donald Knuth would allow us to call an essay that looks a lot like a form of writing that is interpretation, a form of writing that is thinking. Um, and those, those thoughts, if you will, <coughs> are code. Um, and, and so that's where I find, um, I, I don't know, I have to admit a little bit of confusion because I'm a fan of both of your works. <laughs> I find a little bit of confusion about why you're making the distinction, although Kate, at the end of your presentation, you were really putting that into doubt. Um, at the very end, you were saying, should we maintain this distinction between cognition and thinking? Um, but I guess I want to ask, I want to ask the question again, and um, with respect to this question of digital writing. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just chime in quickly, and then we can get to get to the discussion. Uh, I, I think the, the the project I'm working on right now is in in a large uh, part a historicization of exactly that problem. In other words, the problem of, of where do we identify this line between the human and the non-human in an age where uh, objects, and particularly technical objects, have certain kinds of cognitive functions. Whether they really are thinking or not, the, the, the reality is that when we have the calculators of Leibniz or or of Pascal, or we have the, the difference engine of Babbage, we see something that had previously only ever been performed by a human mind performed automatically by a machine. And that raises all sorts of questions about what is exactly the, the, the distinction between the human and the, the, let's say, the cognitive performances of other systems, including technical systems. Now, what I found interesting today is, is in both of your talks, there was this moment where that human dimension was clearly identified. The, the production of meaning versus non-meaning, and in, in your terms, Bernard, the, the capacity for de-automatization. And what I've been trying to, to do in my own work is, again, think of that as a historical problem, which is to say, at different eras of industrial um, and social organization, what that, what that means is in some ways dependent on the kind of machinery of both society and the machinery of, of literally the machinery that we work with. And I think what I've, what I've been thinking more, being very influenced by Bernard's work in the last couple of years, is, is to see this history as, as, as provoking a challenge for the contemporary era to think about what is the nature of, of the distinction of the human in, in an age where so much of what we used to take to be cognitively special has, has really been taken over by, not just taken over by computers, but in some ways extended, amplified, magnified, and in, in realms like big data, digital humanities, they're doing cognitive actions that are impossible to do in, in a human mind, even a systematic human mind that's connected with other networked minds. 
Uh, now, this is not to say computers versus the human or what have you, but it's really to put a bit of pressure on this concept that I think came up in both of your talks. What exactly is the capacity for de-automatization? Where does that come from, or how do we think about that in an age where, um, I have to admit, I'm not sure we can make a distinction between material processes and human processes. In other words, in the age of neuroscience, is it really possible to assume a difference between something like human judgment, human meaning, and the performance of material systems? At least that's what I'm kind of leading towards as the, 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 the challenge of, of this long history of thinking human cognition in relationship to technical systems and social systems. So I think we're all kind of involved in, in, in similar projects and we are hoping to, to provoke you in some ways with, with our own work uh, to, to think more, more about some of these ideas. So we'll open it to you and then we'll open it to the audience to, to push you in even more directions. Well, uh, to respond to Warren's question, uh, I do not pose the binary interpretation and calculation. One reason I don't pose that binary is that it's too easy to assign all cognitive activities to the interpretive and deny them to the calculative. So instead of that binary, what I have is cognition and thinking. And I would argue that both cognition and thinking are involved with interpretation. So uh, I don't really deal with calculation as such, but maybe calculation is one of those material processes. And um, I would disagree with you about the state of neuroscience now. I do not think that neuroscience has succeeded in making a link, an uncontestable link between material processes and the phenomenon of consciousness, much less higher consciousness. So that's exactly what Gerald Edelman is trying to do with his neuronal clusters idea and his neural Darwin idea. He's exactly trying to provide a neural correlate to consciousness. But still, the neural correlate to consciousness becomes a contributor to consciousness when it demonstrates emergent effects. And because it demonstrates emergent effects, it is itself underlaid by material processes. So I think that you always have material processes underlying any kind of cognitive activity, but they are become capable of cognitive activity when they have those characteristics that I discussed, that is emergent behavior, adaptation, etc. Um, I wanted to, to say firstly that for me, digital writing, I use this uh, expression, very often, is a stage of what I call grammatization. And this process of grammatization, I said today that it occurs with the Paleolithic period, uh, high Paleolithic period, that is uh, uh, 30,000 years ago. And if we want to, for example, to, I, I believe that we are interested in producing together uh, such something like digital studies or software studies, etc. So it's our common interest. Uh, the possibility of producing some, something like digital studies for me needs the development of what I call an organ, a general organology of knowledge. Because the question of digital studies is the last stage of a very old question, which is the organology of knowledge, that is the technology of knowledge, the, the technological uh, dimension of knowledge, the irreducible di technological dimension of knowledge. And technological always means automatical. Because uh, to, to be able, for example, to drink in this bottle like this, it is an automatization of my brain. I need to learn to produce this gesture. You have people in, in the world, in Amazonia, who are incapable to do this and to stay on this, on this seat. And this is an, an interiorization of the technical and artifactual milieu of things. And I add to my answer to your question about Latou is, my problem with Latou is that for him, things and objects are not pharmaca. 
an, uh, an object is a pharmacon. And this is a problem that you must automatize yourself for using it, that this automatization can destroy yourself. Now, if you want to disautomatize your behavior, you must firstly automatize your behavior. And this automatization is not the one of the technical object, but your brain and your body and your affects, etc., etc., your drives, etc., etc. So, uh, the question of, um, of computation or calculation is only the modern stage of another question, which is not calculation, with, but which is analysis. And this is the reason for which I wanted to, to, to insist on, on this concept of understanding in the sense of Kant. When he says, he doesn't say that it is, that it is possible to automatize and to delegate the understanding behavior, the understanding faculty. He doesn't say that, but he knows that. And uh, because the question is not calculation. Calculation is a kind, very specific kind of analysis. But you have a lot of other uh, possibilities of analysis which are not produced by calculation or computation. Computation appears with Descartes as a question. This is the reason for which Heidegger says Descartes invent the modern reason as ratio. That is, ratio means compute and, 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 and calculation. And automatization with Leibniz, Pascal, Leibniz, etc. Et so for me, the question is, uh, in today, computation is the last stage of analysis, which is extremely interesting, interesting, firstly, for the market. Because the market is only a machine for compute. To, 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 to create a market is to create uh, a, a, an analysis like as uh, a compute. You know. So uh, I don't say that for telling that computation is bad because it is a market. It is not only the market. For, for Descartes, it is not at all the market. For Leibniz, it's not at all the market. But for us, it has become the core of what I call potential and retentional industry of tertiary retentions. So I believe that uh, we need to, to produce a critique of automatization. Uh, this critique is not a denouncement. It is not to say that we must destroy or, or limit uh, calculation. It's absolutely impossible, and we need to calculate. This is the reason for which I quoted uh, the poem by uh, Paul Claudel, when he says, a good poem is a compute, which is creating by the compute the impossibility to stay at the level of the compute. And this is extremely strong as, a, as an analysis. And this is a question of synthesis. So that I personally, I, 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 I name the question of interpretation. Not exactly decision. Decision is a kind of interpretation. But, for example, the shaman is an interpreter. And he is not making decisions. It, he is dealing with spirits. Uh, that is, with the dead uh, beings, etc., etc. But you don't have a society without interpretation. But ours. <laughs> because today, the completely centralized and hidden systems of top-downization of bottom-up producing production of our personal data is in fact uh, a system of destruction of interpretation by an only analytic process which is extremely dangerous, which is producing an entropic situation. Now saying this, when you say this, you need to develop not a, a struggle against compute or computer science, you need all to the contrary to to uh, distribute the, the faculty of computation and the time in the time of computer sciences as personally what I call digital studies. And at all levels of, of, of teaching, of education, etc., etc. But not only with computer science. With, for example, a clear intelligence of the status of writing for geometry. 
a clear intelligence of the status of, of uh, grammatization in prehistorical times, etc., etc. It was impossible to do that uh, because for Plato, at the beginning of the academic sphere, it was, it was the first statement of Plato. Logos has nothing to do with techne. And the problem is, and this is what we share with Latour, we believe together with Latour and Kate that it is completely wrong. And we need to overcome this, this, uh, this situation. Would you agree with, um, I think, the implication of James's talk at the end of last session that a network realism is in some ways this kind of critique, uh, mm. a, a gesture towards some kind of productive activity that exposes the network's own logic? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I agree completely. Because for me, for example, about Kant, I published uh, 10 years ago the book which is entitled uh, Time... Um, a cinematic uh, time of cinematic it's, yeah, cinematic I don't, time cinematic time which is the first volume the third volume of techniques and time where I tried to show that in actually in fact we are um, uh, cinematographic beings but it is only possible to think cinematographic dimension of soul or of consciousness when in, at the end of the 19th century, cinematograph as techniques is producing the, the possibility of exter- experimenting this. And I think he said, he said this uh, with the network. Yeah, uh, I, I, All right, so let's good. take some questions from the audience. We have a question right here, Kate. And I know there was somebody in the last session who also had their hand raised. Okay, great. Hi. Uh, in discussions of uh, reality and perception, it's often uh, agreed that we've pretty much come up the, against the limits of what our human senses are able to discover about whether there is a reality and if so, what it is. Science, to some degree, is a way of stepping outside of the limits of our, our senses but I was very interested in the implication of your uh, additional psychic limits of cognition and thinking, the, the, the fact that human thinking is limited uh, by our cause and effect uh, search for meaning. That is, we want if I hold these values, that will lead me to this action, which will have this cause, I mean, uh, this effect, and enable me to uh, go back and change, modify behavior in the future. So if we assume that uh, non-conscious cognition can transcend the limits of human, that human quest for meaning imposes on our investigations of our surroundings, do you think it's possible that the machines uh, we've created to help us with this are going to be able to get past the limits of human uh, perceptions, senses, and uh, psychic bias, and possibly enable us to really see what reality is? Another content wow. question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a new, relatively new philosophical movement called speculative realism, which is all about getting beyond what is called the correlationist circle. And what they mean by that is the post-Kantian argument that we only know the reality, the world for us. That is, we can only know the world through our senses, so therefore the world that we know is always the world for us. And this, uh, these philosophers are very interested in positing philosophies that say, it's not just the world for us, it's the world in itself. And to devise philosophical methods that can reach the world in itself, not just the world for us. That's kind of the deep side of your question, but to respond to maybe the practical side of your question, it's true already that non-conscious cognition is capable of identifying patterns which are not available to human cognition for a variety of reasons. For example, 
uh, you might have a corpora of text too great for any human to be able to read. You've got 10,000 novels. You want to find patterns in those novels. You devise algorithms to find patterns. Or to take an example from the sciences, a scientist named Swanson was able to identify the causes of very rare diseases which could never be identified before because they happened in diverse places, they happened rarely, being rare diseases, but using computer algorithms he was able to determine what the cause of these, disease, these diseases were. So those are instances where non-conscious cognition does actually extend our knowledge of the world. In that case, in, you know, in the case of the rare diseases or discerning patterns in artifacts such as digital humanities are interested in. So the question is, how would we uh, compare or think about those in relation to questions of meaning? I asked my husband, an anthropologist, who's this question, and he says that's hopelessly vague. He says that an anthropologist would never phrase it like that. An anthropologist would say, were there rituals? Were there artifacts? How were the artifacts fashioned, et cetera? And that would be, that would be the surrogates for meaning, so to speak. Um, but my own position is this, that hu my, the whole gist of my argument was that human, the human quest for meaning is being supported, extended, and challenged by non-conscious cognition. So in the case of discovering rare diseases, it was extended by non-conscious cognition. But since non-conscious cognition in and of itself has no sense of meaning, it also asks us to question how central is the quest for meaning in the general scheme of things. Well, in the human scheme of things, it's immense. But the human scheme of things is always instantiated within larger non-human contexts. And therefore, it may behoove us to begin to think about questions of meaning as a parochial interest. And that would be a really different way to think about meaning than to think about meaning is what the world is about. I want to bring up Heidegger since um, Bernard raised, raised the specter of Heidegger and uh, mentioned that uh, Heidegger's notion of, of techne and the evolution of technics in our world, in the human world, is one of uh, standing reserve that for a long time humans used to look at the earth as its own, as you know, as the standing reserve of human uh, being human society so that the river provides us with energy and we build the mill to get energy from the river and the river is our standing reserve but uh, Heidegger said in the 20th century the the problem that modernity poses is that we are the standing reserve we the humans are the standing reserve and there's a very clever English translation of his uh, writing which uses the term human resources that only in to only in a modern society could we conceive of this thing called human resources, which literally, you know, means he takes it very literally that we are the resources. And there is something about um, there's something about all four of your discussion of the human that makes me think of this question of have we become have humans become the standing reserve? For example, the question of being captured by data that uh, we exist to generate some kind of data that then can be captured uh, for more of our disciplining or for our consumption, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and this question of even disautomatization also seems to be this concern of reversing our reserve status in some way. So I just wonder if that sparks anything in, uh, in anyone. It's a very, very important and interesting question. Uh, first, I, I must precise that uh, I agree with Heidegger for saying that uh, modern techniques or technology is different from uh, the previous one, from the, let's say, uh, traditional techniques or technology. But I disagree first in the interpretation of the status of techniques in general for the design analysis, and that is for, for phenomenology and philosophy. 
And uh, I believe also that this discourse on human resources, <laughs> if we can say that in English, which is a very interesting translation, uh, is first extremely um, uh, important in our moment with economy of data, etc., where everybody is producing the human resource as what is called human computing. That is, uh, the participation of, the, of everybody on the world, on, on the earth, for, for um, providing uh, the, not the matter, but the, the value of, of the economic system. But I believe that the first thinker of this is not at all Heidegger, it is Marx. And this is a question of a proletarianization. And my problem with the, the, the Heideggerian analysis is to forget him completely this question of what is called proletarianization. And when he says, when, when Heidegger says in his text on Plato and the Truth, that is on the seventh uh, book of uh, Politeia, when he says that uh, with Plato you, you have a change of the sense of aletheia, which, is, which becomes orthotes, that is exactitude, that is computation, in fact. At the end, it is computation. The question is uh, that um, uh, Plato, criticizing the proletarianization of the soul by writing, because he says that, it is Writing is an exteriorization of knowledge which, which is producing a kind of proletarianization of the soul, or of the spirit, or of the mind. The, the, the answer of Plato is to transform, um, the, uh, not to transform, to, de to deny the technical level dimension of the soul, of the, of the noetic soul. And the problem with Heidegger is that he says the transformation of Aletheia into orthotes is the beginning of metaphysics, that is the beginning of, of the wrong way of philosophy. But he says with, with Plato that the soul has nothing to do with techniques because the question is not techniques but the essence of techniques, as he says. So th this discourse is extremely ambiguous and extremely problematic for me, and even dangerous, because he's a kind of forgetting of the history of the 19th century of philosophy, where Marx, Nietzsche, etc., posed those questions in other terms, in political terms, and economic terms. I have an answer to that too, Gail. I think that's a really interesting question. So, the, of course, the idea for Heidegger of standing reserve is that the earth just becomes resources to be exploited for profit. It loses any value in and of itself. And dating back to the 1960s, there were already popular culture uh, productions that were imagining a Richard Dawkins-like inversion. So Richard Dawkins made his whole career on a simple thought, namely that instead of uh, humans passing on genes, genes were in control and used humans to pass on genes. And so a similar inversion would be instead mm. of humans using computers, computers are using humans to make more computers. Oh, and I just want to bring up McLuhan because McLuhan said a, a chicken is an egg's idea to get more eggs. Exactly. <laughs> so a human is a computer's idea to get more computers. And already there was an early film called The Colossus Project in which, uh, in which a computer does just that, takes over the humans. But in our contemporary moment, a simple example of that are those little distorted letters that you get and then you have to decode them and because presumably you're not a robot, you're a human and you have these sophisticated visual capabilities so you write down the letters. Well, now scammers have automized that so that they're using you to make bots which will trick websites into thinking that they're humans. So first you have to prove your humanhood 
and after you prove your humanhood, mm. then you're subject to being scammed so that your human humanhood recognition now becomes a robot facility to trick other re websites. So, you know, that's not a, a complete dominance like the Forbin project imagined, but it's a little example where human unique capabilities are being captured within uh, automatic systems. And it, they're extracting from you five seconds of labor, but five seconds of labor multiplied by millions of times is a lot of money. And the, but, and the insult, to, adding insult to injury, it's, it's the question of proving humanhood <laughs> that, it, that the labor is going towards. But, but I want to emphasize that it's not only a question of the essence of technology. I want to emphasize this especially for humanists and artists, that it's also a question of design. So the uh, Frederick Douglass was a, was a runaway slave in the 19th century. Um, and he wrote an auto, his autobiography and became a big part of the anti-slavery movement. Um, there's a chapter where he first goes to, gets off the plantation, and he goes to work for a family as a slave. And they've never had a slave before. And he, he narrates how this does damage to the couple. At first they treat him like a human being. And after they've had him as a slave for a while, they stop treating him as a human being. They start to treat him as a technology, as something that does something for them. And so the question, uh, so I think undeniably when we, when we understand technology to be a standing reserve, if we understand uh, computers, the, the, the idea of what we should be doing with computers is to design them so that there are uh, they are slaves, um, or they are servers. Everybody knows what a web server is, right? Um, the, the whole, the whole uh, lexicon of, of that division of labor is actually in the very technical lexicon of computer science. So if instead of doing that, if we can think about how to design uh, or how to, how to write and design, um, so that computers are, um, let's say, a medium of expression rather than um, a technology that's going to do something for us as a, as a uh, server or a slave might. Um, I, I think that, that's, that's the optimistic um, point of view. That's the, that's, that's, the, that's the possibility on the horizon. But it's not easy because um, that's not the way computers have been developed for hundreds of years. But, but I would note that Turing said exactly that when he was thinking about what an intelligent computer would be. It, it, if we treat a computer as a slave, it will act like a slave. And he imagined, even in 1947, 48, that a properly intelligent computer would have to be more what you're saying, something that, that, that interacts with humans rather than simply serves them. The idea of a universal computer, universal because it can be... It's even before that when he's thinking about a computer that would be the equivalent of of a human who gets inculcated into certain kinds of behaviors by by automatizing themselves, which is something different than than creating a slave. In other words, the computer could be part of a human community or a human machine community. So uh, this question is kind of following up on the earlier comment on, uh, that you made about Knuth and, and his ideas on literate programming. And, and so I'm wondering if, if today sort of there's a little bit of a change in perspective from his ideas that were mostly about describing algorithms and then from there creating narratives that were either for human consumption or for execution of machines and whether today we're kind of at a stage where we need the computation to be much more interwoven into our narratives, and I, a lot of a lot of things that today have import in daily decisions uh, are deeply tied to data and computation. Let's say an economic model that affects how the World Bank makes decisions on austerity is based on how a spreadsheet was computed <laughs> back at Harvard, and whether there was a bug in it or not. And and the decoupling between those computations and the decision making has deep, deep social consequences. And so I can. We can sort of imagine a future where, say, a Wall Street Journal article defending one of these ideas has the code and the data for the computations woven much more closely there to, so that 
the discussion on the ideas and the social impact of them can actually be traced back and interrogate the underlying computational assumptions. And I'm wondering sort of where do you see kind of the, that closer weaving between the computational languages and our human narratives kind of evolving in, in the future? You, I mean, you, you saw that exactly that case play out in the editorials of the, the New York Times, for example, and Paul Krugman's uh, comments on that exact spreadsheet. Um, I, I think uh, Philip Morawski in his book Economics Becomes a Cyborg Science makes the point, by doing a history of, of economics, makes the point that economics is intrinsically interwoven into computers and networks. Like there's, there's no economics now without um, these building blocks that people like uh, von Neumann put into place. Um, so I, I think um, in some sense, yes, it's, it's a much more expanded notion than what Knuth had in mind in the mid-1980s when he was talking about a literate uh, programmer. Um, but it's still, um, I, I, I think by, by him naming a humanities tradition that goes at least back to Montaigne of the essay and what is the essay and what it should be and, and making that the status of uh, a certain set of computational artifacts, the fact that an algorithm could be an essay is a very different notion than an algorithm must either be an industrial process or must be like a piece of engineering. Right? You have a whole area just called software engineering where software is seen as an engineering artifact. Um, so it's a very different, it's posing a very different status for what that is, and it makes it clear that it's a part of, of, uh, of the humanities, and it makes it clear that it's a, it's a part of, of making an argument. And you might be wrong, too. Even, even if you have an algorithm um, that you can prove correct, it might be wrong about what you're trying to use it for. follow-up that relates to that. Um, I, I wondered if um, we might think about a little bit about failure, and I think that relates directly to this question of the essay, um, in the sense that these rational calculative processes that you've described, um, we, we've fo been following them as if they function, but what happens when they don't? And in what way do... I don't want to call it the irrational, but what would not fall into the usual categories of reason, what falls out of that, what fails, how does that fit into the thinking that you've been talking about today? Well, it's one of my favorite topics. So um, I think that, that you're right to say that you don't pose kind of the error against the truth or the failure against the, the, the system that is somehow... Um, perfect, but the, to think that, especially um, when when bringing in humans and machines into some kind of some kind of connection, is to recognize that the human body, as well as the human mind, as well as human societies, are really predicated on failure. They're they're not designed from the top down. They really are um, um, experiments, and that you could think with uh, Kongiem, for example, that life is a continual improvisation mm -hmm. experiment. That failure is. <coughs> endemic. And in my own work, I've noticed that comes up in the early computer era. Turing, again, just to mention him, says exactly the same thing, is that for a truly intelligent computer to develop, it would have to be capable of making mistakes. Otherwise, it isn't learning, it isn't testing its own limits. So uh, I think it's an important distinction that is often lost. You think of the bug or the glitch as something that needs to be eradicated, whereas in fact, if we think of human beings, we should be thinking of, of failure and error as something... Um, Productive. One more question. It's too much of a burden. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was speaking of failure. I was wondering if I could bring the conversation back to the conversations this morning, and I think it relates to what you're all talking about, and that has to do with pedagogy. Um, somebody this morning admitted to being a, a worried luddite. Um, <laughs> And I wanted to ask about the pharmacon of digitization, whether it's more poisonous than not. And I'm speaking as somebody in the classroom working with students who seem increasingly unable to get through 
a long narrative or to write in a way that shows topic sentences, transitions, theses, linear thinking. Um, we could just all give this up because it's on its way out. I'm wondering if there's, um, if my cause for alarm is just negative thinking. It's, it's just one, one thing from this morning. Um, William Gibson and Thomas Pynchon were, were brought up. Uh, these were both people who were not raised as readers in the digital world. These are people who were raised in the readers of, of the old book. So I'm just wondering if the old book technology has led to this kind of really brilliant thinking that's going on in the digital world. But what happens to a generation of people who eventually have no experience of the old book? <laughs> This is a question of, for me, this is a question of the status of, of the digital in education in general. And uh, it's also the question of inter and transgenerational relations today. Um, it's not a new question, but uh, this question is uh, the question of education as such. But today we have to solve or to, to, to practice this question and to theorize this question in front of a very specific pharmacon, which is uh, uh, based on speed and, and on and the speed of machines, but not only of machines, on the market, on innovation, of competition in economic sphere, etc. Et and here, for me, there are a lot of questions, but yeah, there are mainly two first questions. The first one is, uh, I, I come back to the question of digital studies. Uh, today, we have to develop in the academic sphere, academic sphere in the large sense, that is uh, grammar school, uh, uh, high school, university, and uh, laboratories. The, the, the places where uh, we pretend to teach uh, the, let's call rational knowledge or, or critical knowledge. In these uh, spheres, we have to completely reinvent not the pedagogical relation. This is also a question, but the, the real question is not at all the pedagogical relation. The real question is a relation to knowledge. And, uh, for example, about the capacity for the, the economic question you, you asked before about uh, uh, the computing in the economic sphere and its uh, social consequences and its uh, social stakes, etc., etc. <coughs> if we don't have a complete transformation of the theory of economics, and of the status of techniques in economy, and particularly of uh, writing techniques. For example, in the theory of, 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 of Monet today, if you read the theories of Monet, you don't find the question of writing, but with Clarisse Ehrenschmidt, who is not at all an economist, but an Hellenist, a specialist on anthropologists, a specialist of, of ancient Greek society, but in the sphere of, of the, in the economic sphere, you have nobody thinking what I call the tertiary retention uh, monetization, you know, condition of, of monetization. And if it is possible today to use, for example, algorithms for making a, an automatic trading, it is because at the beginning, money is uh, such a pharmacon. But this pharmacon doesn't work at not at all, like uh, the, the the digital pharmacon. The digital pharmacon is absolutely specific. If we don't have a, a complete analysis of, the, of, of, of economics, uh, beginning with this question of, the, I call that pharmacon or organology, but you can call this uh, like writing or artifact, or I don't care. But the question is how to instantiate this in, in economics. But it is also the question in grammar, or in linguistics, in mathematics. The condition of uh, 
geometry, arithmetics, etc., etc., is also a pharmacological condition. For example, reading Husserl, the big text of Husserl about the European crisis of knowledge, which is a, the big book of the 30s about the epistemological question uh, pointed out by uh, uh, the transformation in algorithmic uh, functioning of arithmetic and, and mathematics. What is at stake behind this? It is a pharmacology of knowledge, of, of mathematics as such. And he says, if German people decided to decide, they didn't decide, but uh, choose to, to, come on, the, um, the referendum the, with Hitler, 89% uh, people in Germany uh, supported Hitler in, in, in 19. 34, Husserl says it is firstly because there is a crisis of knowledge. And this crisis of knowledge is the result is that young people in Germany, for example, don't believe now in knowledge. They don't believe. And they, believe, and they, they look for somebody like Hitler, another one. We are at the moment exactly in Europe in the same situation. This is the reason for which Europe is now in a very dangerous situation. But this is also the question of the geography, for example. You can't uh, teach and theorize geography without uh, uh, thinking uh, 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 maps uh, from the beginning of maps in, uh, in, in the 7th century or 6th century before Christus uh, until uh, uh, GPS, etc., etc. And it is it is the case for all types of knowledge. So we have to produce a profound revolution, a theoretical and practical revolution of teaching and knowledge. And this is the only possibility to answer your question. By the rules of the internet, we have now violated Godwin's law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, which, which technically means it's the end of the thread. Uh, but do any, does anybody want to quickly respond to the... How can you respond to that? That's like yeah. the final statement. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> we're, we're not actually on the internet right now, so maybe we can set Godwin's Law aside for two minutes. Do people want to... My, my, my two cents is, with respect to the pharmacon, I think we have, and the pharmacon of writing, I think we have to follow Plato and not Socrates. And that is to say, we need to teach our students how to write prose, and we need to teach them how to write programs. All right, please join me in thanking our panel.